This afternoon, we, we have 10 faculty speakers, and from the looks of the program, um, I, this session should be every bit as thought-provoking and exciting. So, so thank you, everyone, for coming at a very busy point in the semester, and I'm especially grateful to our, our 10 faculty presenters this afternoon, so thank you. So let's go ahead and get started. Our first speaker is Jessica Boone from the Department of Religious Studies, and the title of her talk is The Mystical Language of Pain. Dark. Uh, my name is Jessica Boone. I uh, focus on medieval and early modern Christianity with a particular emphasis on mysticism uh, in Christianity. And uh, to start off with, I need to explain what mysticism is uh, because it's a frequently used word that is uh, frequently misused in uh, non orthodox ways. Uh, Christian mysticism, uh, most Christians think about any kind of uh, interaction with or contact with God as being limited to the afterlife. Uh, mystics are those people who have decided for some reason that they have had some kind of immediate or direct experience of the presence of God. Um, this uh, is complicated in their uh, accounts of it by the fact that uh, Christians also define God as infinite, omnipotent, and all-knowing, and human language is finite. So if you're trying to talk about the experience of the infinite, you end up with a problem of language. Uh, and I look a lot at the uh, language play that results. Uh, people really try to um, turn language in on itself in interesting ways to try to express something by definition beyond language. So for example, they will negate the use of language even as they're talking. They'll say, well, the Bible says that God is good, and so we have to say that God is good. But God is not good in our sense of good. We say the cupcake is good, we say the dog is good. This is not the way that God is good, and so God is not good in a human sense. Um, another popular way to talk about an experience you consider to be mystical is to use the language of human interaction that is frequently considered the most intense. So there's a, a numerous strands of love mysticism that draws on the experience of falling head over heels in love maps that on to something as uh, intense as uh, the infinite. Um, some people just quit language altogether and go into geometric designs, and uh, et cetera. One of the um, pieces of all of this discussion of language is that a lot of that discussion of language is predicated on the fact that you also can't have images of the infinite, that it would not make any sense uh, a, for that to be possible. And this feeds into the sort of Neoplatonic strain in Christianity that rejects uh, the body, that tries to get beyond the body into a non-bodily spiritual experience. Um, given all of that, the notion of the mystical language of pain, which is what I proposed as my title, makes no sense. Because pain is how we often most experience body. I don't really think or notice my knees until they hurt. I don't think about my sinuses until I have a sinus headache. The um, pain makes body most, uh, it to the, brings it most to the forefront of our consciousness of almost any kind of experience that we have. Um, Elaine Scarry, in her influential book, The Body and Pain, talks about the fact that pain both is the truth of the body, the presence of the body, but also the moment uh, when um, a human who is not in the midst of mystical experience most, most reaches or comes up to in, against uh, inexpressibility. That pain is absolutely and utterly real to the experiencer of the pain and absolutely not fully real to anybody else. No matter what adjective I use, no matter uh, what exclamation I use uh, and how Anglo-Saxon it gets, I will never be able to convince anyone in this room of exactly the type or quality of the pain that I'm experiencing. So that experience is always suspect. So in a sense, both pain and mystical experience are utterly inexpressible and therefore utterly disbelievable to anybody but the person having the experience. Um, pain is uh, <coughs> traditionally not uh, presumed to be part of mystical discourse because it is so bodily. What I work on um, is a number of ways that people have in fact had recourse to pain. 
Uh, one is uh, a mystic in the Middle Ages who actually describes uh, love mysticism through uh, the metaphor of the jousts done in the name of courtly love. Uh, it derates God as love, as the lady love um, sought by the mystic, but also then makes that God as love uh, joust back against the mystic. And actually, God as love uh, uh, strikes the mystic, burns the mystic, beats up the mystic, um, in essence, using a language of erotic pain to describe that intensity of the mystical experience. The other piece that I've been working on more recently, um, as in uh, last week, I went to Spain to um, view the modern version of uh, a practice that began in the 1520s, my time period in Spain, which is um, the Holy Week processions, where they process through the streets uh, with images that are for the most part of uh, the body and pain of Jesus, responded to uh, by the people around him. So here you see him emaciated, uh, blood down his back, but you also see the response of Mary and John um, and in contemplation. Uh, here's another uh, version. This one could not come out during Holy Week because it was raining all over Spain. Um, so this is inside, but it was supposed to be out in the street. Um, and here you have the Jews reacting. Um, and here is a version of Mary reacting where there's actually um, the thing in her hand going down in is a sword. Um, which is the physical iteration of the emotional grief that she's having, that it's um, a sword piercing her heart. In uh, 1520s in Spain, when this began, this was the moment of the Inquisition, um, so the Jewish reaction was very important. It's also a time when um, they were coming up with meditative and mystical methods called the Passion of Two, where all of this pain and suffering that we focused on was as much about Mary as it was about Jesus. Uh, and how this becomes mystical is um, a series of techniques where you imagine these occurrences not outside of you, but as actually occurring inside of you. That uh, your entrails, as they say in Chinese, become the site of uh, the Passion of Christ, and your, col the, your spine is the column to which Jesus is tied, your heart uh, uh, is where the cross is um, landed, and uh, you end up feeling the experience of the divine as the ultimate mystical experience. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jess. Patricia Amaral of Romance Languages will now speak on language use matters. Um, well, I, I'm in the Department of Romance Languages, and uh, my training is as a linguist. So um, to get started, I thought I would um, give you an idea of what a linguist does. And um, a while ago, one of my nephews, who was six at that point, um, asked me what I did. So I came up with um, an explanation for him, and he concluded, after um, I told him what I did. Oh, sorry. I forgot to do that. So he said, I see, you don't pay attention to what people tell you, just to their words. <laughs> and um, I think this is actually a pretty accurate description of what I do, so I thought I would give it to you. Um, and if you also pay attention to words, you may have noticed that um, the title of this talk is actually ambiguous. So language use matters could be interpreted as meaning um, that language use is important, right? I analyze this as a clause. or um, this could be just an unphrased topics about language use. And um, the reason I did that was because I wanted to um, talk today a little bit about ambiguity and um, why I'm interested in this. Um, all, all natural languages are ambiguous, and we know that hearers um, entertain hypotheses about possible interpretations of a sentence all the time, and we're not even aware of that. Um, and the fact that this is a crucial feature of language um, can be noticed by the fact that actually it affects language change. It affects especially the way that meanings change over time, what we call semantic change. So 
Um, in my work, um, I focus on semantic change in the, um, the meanings, the way that uh, meanings change over time, especially looking at um, degree adverbs, so words like um, very in English or beaucoup in French or mucho and muy in Spanish, for example. Uh, focus in the Romance languages, but some of the principles we see in the way these meanings change can be found across languages. And especially I'm interested in this notion of gradability. Why do we conceive of certain um, properties as having degrees? How do they relate to notions like prototypicality, um, things that um, psychologists have worked on? And how does this uh, play a role in the way that we, we um, our concepts of time, for example, and um, how, how they are uh, they're framed in language? So today, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about one specific case, a case of um, ambiguity and how it played a role in semantic change, looking at Ibero-Romance, um, in particular at Spanish. So I've been working on the word algo, um, and in contemporary Spanish, algo can be used as an indefinite pronoun. It means something, okay, like in the first sentence. Um, Le dio algo pesado, she gave him something heavy, Okay, where the adjective agrees with the noun, with the, with the pronoun, algo, it's masculine. Um, and it can also be used as a degree adverb that means a bit or slightly. As you have here, la mujer estaba algo cansada, a bit tired. And here there is no agreement, so we know it's, it's behaving as an adverb. Now, for most speakers of Spanish, nowadays, there's no relation between um, the indefinite pronoun and the degree adverb. But we know that historically, um, they're actually related. And if you look at data from the 13th uh, century, you see, um, like in the first graph here, that most instances we find are of, uh, of algo as a pronoun, um, and some as a noun, which is totally lost now. Um, and there were no instances of algo that we, uh, as an adverb, like in the sentence we saw before. However, if we look at the 16th century, and these are data uh, from the 16th century, we find that um, we have about 35% instances where it's already an adverb. And um, these ones here are cases of ambiguity. These are the ones I'm particularly interested in, in which the sentence could be interpreted as having either an indefinite pronoun or a degree adverb. And um, so my question is what happens in those sentences and what role do they play in the history of this word? So um, if you look up here, the ambiguous sentences we find are uh, constructions in which algo occurs in a partitive construction with the preposition de, which is of. So um, it means basically something of, and then we have a noun, okay? Um, where the most normal interpretation is part of a whole. So for, have, for example, we have here something of his face, something of his body, and th these are uh, we count nouns where we're talking about a part, not the whole, and the exact um, identity of this part is not given, not known by the speaker, or is not relevant in the context. What is interesting is that at some point, um, we find in the 14th and 15th centuries, some examples in which we find ambiguity and we find nouns that are not um, holes anymore in the same way. So we have, for example, this, it had something of redness where um, the speaker is talking about a fruit and says there is some element that is red, but it could also be interpreted as it has a bit of redness. It's a bit red as a degree adverb. And um, this type of ambiguity is interesting because algo de becomes interpreted as a unit. So algo de becomes the degree word basically. And over time, the de gets lost, and it starts to occur in contexts where the pronoun wouldn't be possible. So this means it's about the weather. The weather improved a little bit, or um, the peel of the fruit is a little bit green. Okay, so here it cannot be um, a pronoun anymore. So why um, do I care about this, and why does language use matter? Well. Because the way that language users interpret ambiguous um, sentences and they enrich them with inferences and world knowledge actually affects the way they start analyzing language and the way they force language to change over time. So the hypothesis about possible interpretations affect the meanings of words and constructions. And they actually shape grammar because they guide um, language change. So I just thought I would leave you with some food for thought from um, 
Gilbert uh, on interpretation and the risks of interpretation. Thank you. And now Ufa Bergeton from Asian Studies will discuss history word by word, lexical semantic approach to epistemic change in early China. Uh, so, like the former speaker, I also used to do linguistics. I, I'm now trained as a historian, and that's my job description, but um, in a firm, former life, I was a linguist. And I think that'll um, show through in my speech today. So, as the topic, um, as the title of my talk indicates, history word by word. Uh, my work is mostly historical in nature. However, my research methodologies are also uh, heavily influenced by theories of lexical semantics, just like the <laughs> previous speaker, but in a different sense, I'm applying it to historical work. And um, since the topic that I study is the cultural awareness in early China and the development of concept of cultural awareness, my work also overlaps with anthropology. So typically, historical research is conducted on texts um, but I take a different approach and I focus on the word instead, as you can see by the title. So I'll get back to what I mean by that. Um, that is namely that I'm interested in how changes in word meanings can be used to study epistemic changes in cultural awareness for this topic specifically. Um, so currently I'm working on a book project with the tentative title you see here, Identity and Metaculture in Early China or Pre-Chin China which is from before 221 BCE. So in this project, I use large uh, text corpora, um, and I study lexical changes in those text corpora um, uh, to basically trace the interconnections between the emergence of what I call proto-anthropological terms and concepts on the one side, and uh, changes in the vocabulary of identity on the other side. So, so here you see some Chinese. Uh, so the consensus seems to be that uh, concept of cultural identity emerged at a certain point during the first uh, millennium BC. I work on the really early period. Uh, so exactly when is still a matter of disputes. We don't have that many texts and they're also difficult to date. Um, I agree that there was a shift in the meaning of the term E that you see here. Whoops, pressed the wrong thing. So this term uh, changed from referring to specific non-Chinese groups to becoming the default term for cultural others. But I feel uneasy about using the modern English concept and term culture to talk about early Chinese concepts uh, of identity as is done in most previous studies. So let's see. So um, to mitigate this hermeneutical problem, I propose to study language specific terms for culture specific categories of culture. Um, so what do I mean by that? Uh, namely, I put up the hypothesis that if new concepts of cultural identity emerged in the first uh, millennium BCE, as is proposed, and I agree, then presumably a vocabulary of these concepts, um, proto-anthropological concepts, and terms in which those identities were conceptualized and formulated is likely to have appeared at the same time. That's the hypothesis. So, in this passage that you see here, it's a text from the 3rd century BCE, um, you see um, an illustration of how these language-specific terms for indigenous concepts of culture are used. So here, this text, which is about music, talks about the former kings and how they diligently created the ideal patterns, the word in Chinese is wen, up here, for music. And it, the text also exhorts the reader to keep the customs, the su, of the E, we've seen this term, the non-Chinese, right? And the deviant notes from daring to bring chaos to the elegant standards of music of the Chinese. Um, so here you see the term when used to refer to what I would call a new concept of high culture um, or civilization. And um, the term su refers to uh, local customs, inferior local customs. So this, these two terms, when and su, are part of this new proto-anthropological terminology of culture that emerged in this period uh, from the 5th to the 3rd century BCE. So we've seen, oops, <laughs> uh, yes, we've seen the, the top part, right, the, 
changes in the meaning of the term E. Now, what I suggest is that, as I've said, we look at how these cultural, the concepts of cultural others were informed by this uh, terminology of, um, well, these proto-anthropological terms. Um, so, um, yes. So basically I say that these two words, E and when, they change meanings in the same period. So in the early period, when meant something like beautiful or patterned, and now after the fifth century, it comes to mean something like high culture, ideal patterns and conventionalized behavior. And this change happens at the same time as development of this uh, term E as used to refer to basically others in, as cultural inferior. Uh, okay, so let's go on. So uh, let me summarize. Compared to previous studies, at least I claim, <laughs> I have, uh, by combining the study of um, proto-anthropological terms and the study of the vocabulary of identity, uh, I can use those to date the appearance of these changes more precisely. I also avoid the ethnocentric uh, baggage of the use of the modern English concept of culture in the study of early Chinese texts. So just finally, uh, what is new about this lexical semantic approach to epistemic changes? I use words rather than text as sources, and I trace lexical semantic changes in word meanings in large text corpora. And uh, I emphasize lexicalization, which is the coining of these new words that reflect the importance of these words in, um, in um, epistemic changes, I would argue. So the question is, how do we contextualize words? I suggest, because, just like contextualizing sources, right, and texts, so how do we contextualize them? By linking them to the speech community who coined these new terms and the context in which they, they emerged. And for these concepts, I suggest that there was a new group of specialists of moral philosophy and statecraft that emerged in China at this point in the middle of the first millennium uh, BCE who were responsible for coining these terms. So I haven't given you much detail of uh, this analysis, but I hope you have an overview of my research project and the methodologies that I use. Thank you. Thank you, Ufa. Um, Pris Priscilla Lane of Germanic and Slavic Languages will speak on Beyond Blackface, Poaching Blackness in German Popular Culture and the Limits of Appropriation. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I came to UNC uh, fall of 2011 uh, from UC Berkeley where I studied 20th century German film, uh, popular music and literature. Um, and the main focus of my research is the construction of German identity. Um, and my approach to German studies is, uh, I find it important to look beyond the nation's borders. Uh, so to think about what kind of foreign influences contribute to the way German culture is defined. Um, and my theoretical approach um, is to draw on critical race theory and gender studies uh, for this purpose. Um, so I tend to, to focus on um, the cultural production of minority groups in Germany, like Turkish Germans, Afro-Germans, or you know, Asian Germans, um, and also how these groups are represented. Um, and the project that I wanted to talk to you today about um, is my book manuscript, um, which I'm still working out the title, <laughs> so I'm going to leave that away. Um, but uh, the, f the focus of this manuscript um, is German's engagement with uh, black popular culture in the post-war era, so post-1945, um, and specifically how the performance of blackness um, challenges a, a hegemonic notion of, of German masculinity. Um, so the setting of my investigation is um, East and West Germany, post-45, um, and some people, or I'd say most people don't realize um, how influential uh, African-American culture specifically was in Germany after the war. Um, so first of all, you had a large amount of black GIs stationed in the West. Um, then there were black political icons like Martin Luther King Jr. or Angela Davis who were popular in the West and in the East. Um, and you had um, children born to black GIs, uh, so a generation of Afro-German children who are referred to as um, occupation children or brown babies, and they caused quite an uproar uh, in the media. Um, 
And then you know, the kind of ambiguous uh, idea of black popular culture, um, which uh, I draw on Stuart Hall's definition uh, for that. So uh, according to him, black popular culture could be anything from behavior, um, music, style, artistic expression that's inflected by members of the African diaspora and shared throughout the diaspora. Um, now in my manuscript, I focus mostly on African American influence, but occasionally it's, it's kind of thrown together into a pot with say African cultures and West Indian. So sometimes blackness can be very ambiguous in Germany. Um, so in my manuscript, um, I look at German protagonists um, in literature and film who, uh, as I say, poach black popular culture in order to rebel against German culture and German masculinities. Um, and I'm still, I'm still playing with different terms to use. I've thought about using appropriation or mimicry. Um, at the moment, I've settled on the term poaching um, because uh, I was inspired by the way uh, de Soto um, uses it um, to mean a, a way of reading a text or a way of engaging with a text. Um, so specifically, I find it interesting that, according to him, a poacher unhinges a text from its origins um, and uh, treats a text as merely an object and suspends his complicities um, with the text. And for the poacher, the text becomes a tool of mobility. And so the way I see um, the appropriation of blackness uh, in post-war Germany is that um, often uh, if a character wants to differentiate themselves, say, from an older generation that, that was implicated in Nazism, you know, aligning oneself with black culture becomes kind of a shorthand to say, you know, that was my parents' generation, you know, I, I'm in solidarity with oppressed peoples. Um, so my main argument in the book um, is that black popular culture is, is very central to defining German identity in this post-war period. Um, and that this struggle around defining Germanists um, uh, primarily happens uh, among men, at least in the texts uh, that I use. Um, so just to give a little bit more um, historical context, um, the reason why I believe um, blackness becomes so important in the post-war era is because um, uh, the, it's, it's no longer socially acceptable to discuss Jews as others um, after 45. And uh, several other scholars have argued that um, blackness uh, kind of comes in as a, a new, the new other. So uh, a politically correct way to define oneself against something. So German is white and you know, black is foreign, it's something else. Um, so blackness, um, allows for new parameters um, according to which the hegemony can police whiteness and, and German culture. Um, but so you did have Germans who were, you know, scared by, by the influence of, say, uh, rock and roll <laughs> or uh, an earlier example, jazz um, in the 20s. Um, but there were other Germans who enthusiastically um, embraced uh, this new, new black popular cultures, especially music. Um, so I already mentioned um, the example of jazz, which I think more people are familiar with. Um, but actually, the first, um, the first time that um, a black musicians performed in Germany was the Fisk Jubilee Singers, so uh, Negro spirituals, which were less controversial at the time. Um, but uh, anyway, so um, music, music is important for my book um, because it kind of organizes uh, the structure of the book. So in each chapter, I, I look at a genre in a, used in a specific text, so rock, uh, hip hop, zydeco, blues. Um, and the reason I find music so important is because I find it's often someone's gateway um, to black popular culture. Um, and um, the thing about music is that often it's, it's thought of as, on the one hand, modern, um, but on the other hand, primitive, because you know, black popular culture is associated with Africa, and that sense, because it's primitive, th there's this idea that it's more liberating than, than the restraints of German culture. Um, so anyway, to, to close, um, I just wanted to mention um, the stakes of my project. So why, why is this important to me? Um, I find that this pattern of associating blackness with resistance or rebellion um, leads to a, 
a very narrow idea of what blackness is and to an idea that always separates blackness from Germanness. So black can't be German. Um, and that's very problematic for actual black Germans who are born and raised there and considered others from without and not really a part of the culture. Thanks. Thank you, Priscilla. Next, Sabine Grufa from the Department of Art will speak on I Have Always Been a Dreamer, The Problem with Documentary. So I don't really have a problem with documentary, but I want to use a theme from my film, I've Always Been a Dreamer, as a framework to talk about the relationship between the imaginary and the real, focusing on the word image in imaginary. Um, the original crisis of documentary is that documentarians thought they could get closer to the truth by directly observing it. But the truth is a complicated thing, and so is the image. In this quote by Bill Nichols, who wrote a seminal text on documentary, Nichols explains the challenge of the documentary genre and the indirect relationship between filmic representation and the real. Many documentarists would appear to believe what fiction filmmakers only feign to believe or openly question, that filmmaking creates an objective representation of the way things really are. In this talk, I'd like to show how images function in my film, I Have Always Been a Dreamer, an essay film about globalization and urban ecology using examples of two cities in contrasting states of development, Dubai and Detroit. Within the context of a boom and bust economy, the film questions the collective ideologies that shape the physical landscape and impact local communities. In this image, a still from the film, one can see how in a place like Dubai, the legacy of British colonialism creates an imaginary ideal exemplified here in this image of a hobbyist landscape painter rendering the glorious landscape of future housing developments. In this built landscape, the image is literally plastered billboard style over the environment. This image of the young white man on his yacht is not meant for the workers and builders from Kerala in South India who are forced to work in this environment but rather for a perfect white expatriate community who might choose Dubai as a part-time home away from home. This image from the film shows how the real and the imaginary can converge in the space of an image. We can see the same logic happening in Detroit, albeit an unsuccessful attempt, but an attempt nonetheless. So that says building Detroit's past into the future. I'd like to believe that it's just a question of scale, um, that if the sign was bigger, it might be more convincing. And of course, Dubai's government makes a concerted effort to promote itself through carefully curated images on government-owned and controlled websites. These are virtual images of homes on the Palm Islands, most of these dwellings were sold before being built. Realtors use computer-generated 3D renderings of, space, of spaces to market the housing. In this case, the image appears before the place. The image is not photographic evidence of a place, but rather a proposal for a place, a safe and secure place to bring, to bring a family or start a business. I found Dubai to be a place very concerned about its image to the world. The image is controlled to the point that I was not able to shoot in front of the Burj Al Arab, which is that building um, behind my sound person. Um, the good news is that I had an official permit to shoot in public space. The bad news is that there was no public space. 
The closest I got to the Burj Al Arab was through the special effects of a small photo studio. The, gra <laughs> <laughs> the grassy ground does not really exist, but it makes for a nice picture. Uh, Greenfield Village in Dearborn, Michigan is a fictional village just outside Detroit, a leafy theme park imagined by Henry Ford where manufacturing cars happens in a small garage and Thomas Edison lives right next to the Wright brothers and Mary had a little lamb. Um, in the summers, Michigan school children can visit this Henry, F Henry Ford reenactor, dreamingly recounting the good old days. And groups of actors in three-piece suits and straw hats sing about the benefits of owning a Ford. Perhaps this theme park imaginary is where the dream of suburb suburbia was formed. The theme park aesthetic has its counterpoint in Dubai where virtuality takes physical form. This is a shot taken from a Ferris wheel in Global Village, an immense open air shopping center in the middle of the desert where every Islamic country is represented by thousands of stores. The lake is an artificial pool that surrounds the central plaza. Some snapshots an expatriate I interviewed took of Dubai in 1970 are shown to me as evidence of how fast Dubai is developing. While images of Highland Park homes in Detroit, built as living spaces for workers of the now defunct Ford factory, quickly become evidence for a failing economy. Places like this are exploited by photographers for their aesthetic beauty, sparking an, enrage, an enraged response from Detroiters sick of quote unquote ruin porn. Detroiters who feel that the circulation of these types of images prevent Detroit from reinventing itself. This is an image from universal newsreel footage of the Detroit riots. While a historical event, images like these still weigh heavily on the minds of Detroiters and have become representative of what many suburban Detroiters still think uh, downtown Detroit looks like. I hope these examples from my film somewhat complicate the false documentary notion that the image is a window on the real, replacing it with a somewhat more complex notion of how the image and the real are interrelated. Images may draw from collective ideologies or market imaginaries. They have the power to play and sometimes prevent our apprehension of the real. And in some cases, they have the ability to eventually become realized. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sabine. I'm not sure Daniel Kreiss is here. Oh, there you are. Thank you. Wonderful. OK, now you had a class beforehand, just in time. Wonderful. So introducing Daniel Kreiss from Journalism and Mass Communication. And he will be speaking to us on media events, Twitter publics, and active spectatorship. <clears throat> um, I actually teach a, uh, oh, thank you. Uh, a qualitative methods um, seminar uh, in the School of Journalism, um, uh, which I was teaching before this. And it's, it's very apt because this project actually grows out of a collaboration with uh, two grad students that really started in that seminar. Um, so what I'll talk a bit about today um, is uh, this ethnographic project that we conducted at the 2012 DNC in Charlotte. Um, uh, what we really uh, started to do is, is wanted to do a classic ethnographic study of media production uh, at a contemporary um, uh, uh, convention, political convention, uh, which is something that hasn't been done, surprisingly to us, um, since the 1950s. Um, so we set out with a team of researchers. It was myself and two. Uh, a PhD student and a master's student. And essentially what we did is, in a very classic inductive ethnographic study, is set up shop at the DNC 
uh, for five days. Um, so we arrived on uh, uh, Sunday, um, stayed on through um, until the, the final day of the event at Thursday. And in the process of doing that, circulated through hundreds of events around Charlotte. Um, so that includes the arena, um, some of the spaces where journalists worked at the, the convention center. Um, we obtained press credentials, so we went to as many private and exclusive parties we could that were for journalists. Um, but the idea was is that we would conduct our field sites, our research questions uh, inductively in the course of doing that. Um, we also conducted a set of interviews with uh, delegates, um, uh, press outlets who were there, lots of citizen journalists, people who were tweeting, um, uh, as well as social movement actors who so attended the Occupy Wall Street rally, etc. Um, I only have uh, five to seven minutes, so I have to be brief uh, about what I talk about today. But what I really sort of wanted to get at is to talk about sort of the relationship uh, between the classic uh, media event, which I'll say a little bit more in a minute, uh, and sort of what that looks like in our contemporary digital and network age, um, and how should we think about the role of the public and the role of media, uh, media production uh, in this age. Let me just say a little bit of work, I know we have a broad interdisciplinary audience, uh, about sort of Diane and Katz's classic work on media events, which included conventions. Essentially what they were arguing was sort of a neo-Durkheimian perspective that conventions were shared rituals um, in the sense that they were broadcast live and sort of served to both reveal and reify the social order. Um, they were really integrative events um, in the sense that uh, conventions and other media events such as state funerals, they did a lot on the Kennedy assassination for example, was ways in which society came together. It stopped our routine day to days. Um, it, for, uh, it served as the integration of the polity. Uh, it convened folks together, um, etc. Now in sort of recent years a number of scholars have sort of critiqued this paradigm of media events. Um, first, scholars have argued that media technologies have sort of fragmented, which meant that we have a much more sort of pluralistic society, uh, much more pluralistic publics, um, and have doubted sort of whether events were uh, integrative to, to begin with. Um, second, scholars have sort of critiqued this idea of the mediated center, the mediated sort of uh, the center between official journalist narratives and state actors um, as sort of serving an ideological function in terms of sanctioning and legitimating power. Um, and finally, scholars have sort of said that the classic media events conventions basically serve to truncate political power, um, to delegitimize folks who are outside of, of that center. Um, so what we sort of set out to do was just take a look on the ground and see how sort of media events are produced in this age. Um, and we found a couple things that speak to um, this idea of sort of what conventional media events are um, and sort of their political role. First of all, one of the things that we found very striking was that uh, uh, in opposition to scholars who have sort of looked for a growing plurality uh, in terms of, of media production and use and fragmentation, we actually found the opposite. Um, and just to, to talk a little bit about this is, first of all, conventions center political discourse. Um, uh, I'll just throw some statistics out really quickly. Um, these conventions still command massive audiences, so 36 million people watched the final night of the Democratic National Convention. What was also very interesting to us is that they also convene social media and social networking use around it. So 9.5 million tweets uh, about the DNC occurred just in those three days. Um, Barack Obama's speech received 52,000 tweets a, uh, a minute. Um, so massive sort of convening around these events, et cetera. And one of the things that we also discovered was that what we have now is much more sort of active media production that happens around these events. So the events sort of become untethered uh, from official journalistic narratives, uh, which is sort of you can see here. So you see sort of the way political performance works on a number of different levels. You sort of have the official state sanctioned performance, um, which is Barack Obama. Uh, and what we did is try to uh, take a lot of cues from Jeff Alexander's work. He's a cultural sociologist um, at Yale, and he's written a lot about sort of official political performances and the roles that these performances have within the democratic, what he calls civil sphere, which is the sense that uh, democratic performances have their own logic, their own anchoring structural values. Um, so what happens, uh, we argue in our, in our paper, is that you have sort of this official site of performance However, politicians are no longer in control of their own publicity, uh, and neither are journalists. Um, so here's looking down on sort of all the oppositional media, the citizen media, the blogger media that sort of convenes around these sorts of events. They spectate and watch them live, 
Um, but they're also critiquing the official performance that's going on and critiquing the performance of the journalists as well. Um, so we sort of have a new layer uh, of, of, of critique that sort of convenes around these events. Um, we also make the case that what we actually see uh, is active spectatorship. And, and here is sort of is where I'll conclude. Um, one of the things that we really notice is that delegates now are their own media producers in their own right. So you can sort of just see from sitting there, just looking down, this cell phone picture was repeated night after night. Um, so in the sense that, again, producing narratives of media events has become untethered from the official producers um, of the time that Diane and Katz were writing. Um, and we want to make two arguments. First of all, is that spectatorship is much more active than it used to be. In the sense that um, people convening around these events can critique official performances, can create counter narratives, can really work to undermine the legitimacy of the event, or they can work to extend it. So many delegates, for example, would talk about what they wanted to do was produce social media in order to extend what was going on at the convention in their home communities and uh, presumably to further their own organizing efforts. At the same time, if anyone sort of watched the hashtag DNC2012, which becomes this media object that people convene around, um, you sort of get the sense immediately, and we were sort of witnessing this and taking notes on this as we sat there, um, it becomes this massive forum for partisan debate, for social movements to convene around, uh, to sort of become this sort of rollicking uh, uh, partisan divide and debate that occurs within the, the civil sphere on a whole. At the same time, uh, we make the argument that it's still active spectatorship in the sense that this is one step removed from the actual levers of political power, but it's important in terms of providing a new means of, of publicity control over the official uh, uh, sanctioned supporters as well as the journalists who are acting in the name of the public. Um, so with that, I will conclude, um, but generally this is work in progress that we're actually just writing up now. But thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, David Navalinsky and the Department of Dramatic Art will now speak on making connections through theater. Hello. Um, so I'm the director of undergraduate production in, in Dramatic Art. And, and really, I, um, once I got here, my world from what it had been and what I've been trained in just, just started to evolve and started to change. Um, I'm trained as a technical director in theater. And I'm the person who, uh, sort of, to, I always sort of the basic sense is I keep the artists in line. As the technical director, I'm there to sort of manage the shops, oversee how the scenery gets put together, and truly that the main artist that I'm keeping in line is the scenic designer, making sure that they're grounded in reality, um, that their scenery fits within the budget fits within the laws of gravity, all those sorts of things, which they, they, they tend to try to push at every chance. Um, and so as my career evolved um, and I started teaching, I became more involved in production management, which not only then oversees and tries to keep the scenic designer in line, I've encompassed all the other theater artists now. So it, it's, it's more than just that, uh, that one, one theater artist. And so I'm sort of the practical person. Uh, once I got here, I, my, my role has changed to this weird, perhaps a conflict of interest, of the practical person to the artistic person. I work with, as, like I said in my bio, student producers who, um, in choosing their season and putting on the season of, of plays. And how, what my world um, really is becoming is about that theater education. And part of my passion and my drive uh, about that is my own life and, and my involvement in theater. Um, I'm not a typical theater kid. I didn't do theater in high school. I learned several years later, looking back in my high school yearbooks, that we actually had a theater and did productions. I had no idea. Um, and, and I sort of stumbled in the back door. I was looking for something to do. I had a feeling that I wanted to teach. I didn't know what I wanted to teach. Um, I'm very hands-on, tinkery kind of person. I take everything apart at my house and my wife yells at me and takes things away from me because eventually you take something apart and putting it back together more than 10 times and it's gonna break and so on. So anyway, that's, my, that, that, that's sort of my world and now I'm in that artistic world. And I, I stumbled into theater as a way to, to become that tinker and to, to learn how to, to, 
to work with things. I'm from a small um, steel mill town. Um, you find plenty of those Detroit style pictures in, in my hometown. Um, the steel mill's gone, our floor plan's gone. And, and I was that rebellious kid, I was that rebellious tinkerer. And so theater became that outlet. It became a way for me to not be on stage because I've only had one small thing. I danced at the ball in eighth grade and when we did Cinderella. But that is the extent of my acting career outside of acting courses. Um, but it, it became a way for me to have a voice and to, to speak the things that I was interested in. Um, and without going on stage, I, I had these big dreams of being a lighting designer when, when, when I was an undergraduate. And I'm able to take that script and take something that I'm passionate about and add my own artistic in interpretation. And so through that, I could, I could do that. I had my say, my voice was out there, but nobody could see me, but my, they could see my voice. And that's, that's enough for me. Um, and so as theater students come in and out of, of the programs that I've been involved in, there are many of those. Even the actors who are on stage are a little timid to, you know, that's their voice. They're different when they're not, when they're not acting. And so the theater department becomes very different than other departments because we're taking these people in who want to have that voice and want to have that, that say in their world. And they, um, Stunned by the, the iPad looking over. Um, and they, and they, want, they want to have that say, and how we nurture that is really important. I'm on a first name basis with all my majors. It wasn't until I got my first teaching job that I realized that people didn't call their professors by their first name. And it was really weird to me. Um, and so, how those relationships uh, build and how they work. And we're always creating the art, we're working in, a, in an environment that is real. We are producing plays. We're, we need to do it how we would really do it. So if I have a faculty director and a student designer, they become peers in those instances. They're working together. When I'm, you know, when we've got a student director and a faculty designer, they become peers in those, in those collaborative environments. And that's really important. And looking at, looking at how other people deal with that and work with those, um, with those relationships is, is what, sort of where my research is going. Um, the other end of that, which may sound more interesting, but it's all kind of tied in, and I'll, I can do it in a minute and a half. Um, I found a, a theater professor at the American University of Iraq who um, is using, is doing that same thing with his students, giving them a voice. They're doing sort of theater for social change kind of work. And he has all these students that he can't put all of them on stage. And I'm working to sort of help them understand how all those behind the scenes roles and how every role in the theater is a part of that voice um, and, and, and can be a part of that production and how every uh, part of that world is important. So I can go on and on and on and on about myself, but I'll, 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 I'll cut it short. So that's sort of me in a nutshell. So thank you. Thank you, David. Mm -hmm. Next is Lee Weiser from the Department of Music, and he will present an environmental sound installation. Um, I opted out of the PowerPoint, but is there a way to get sound? No. Oh, just for uh, just for sound if you have something on the web. Oh, uh, okay. That's okay. Sorry about that. Uh, hello. My name is Lee Weissert. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in the music department. Um, I'm a composer, and I write music um, for both instrumental and um, electronic uh, forces. Uh, and uh, in addition to uh, kind of providing you with the background of my work, um, possibly solicit uh, any uh, uh, collaborative projects from you or from anyone you know that might. Uh, have similar interests to what I do. Uh, some other areas uh, uh, that my music has kind of collided with in the past are the visual arts, um, especially sculpture, and um, also uh, the natural sciences, um, especially environmental studies, animal communication and behavior. 
uh, physics, acoustics, things like this, dynamic systems, artificial intelligence. Um, if, I, if my CD was in a, a, a record store, it would probably be filed under experimental. That's the most uh, easy ca ca category uh, to put it under. Um, it's a problematic word, of course. But, um, so I rarely use the kind of common musical devices like melody and chord progression in my music. Although it's not a, to say a, it's a controversial or dissonant, uh, um, it's just a different type of um, material I'm using. Uh, lately, I've been interested in using technology uh, as a method of accessing um, kind of hidden areas of sound, hidden areas of the instrument, or um, uh, uh, kind of uh, objects that typically aren't amplified uh, so that we can listen to them. Um, the most obvious examples of this uh, have been my sound installations, which are multi-hour immersive sound installations, which are always a collaboration with uh, Jonathan Kirk, another composer, friend of mine. Uh, so the last installation we did was at Moorhead Planetarium a couple weeks ago. It's called a cryoacoustic orb and it used a, a large, uh, two large spheres of ice uh, frozen inside uh, polycarbonate uh, uh, containers uh, that are mounted on pedestals and uh, inside the pedestals there's heat lamps that uh, create, uh, cause the orbs or the spheres to glow and kind of heated up, uh, they're high voltage heat lamps. Uh, and what we've got um, inside these spheres are uh, hydrophones or underwater microphones that are amplifying the sounds of the melting process. And these are spatialized all around the gallery uh, as well as in wireless headphones. So you can listen for hours on end to this kind of dense, uh, complex textures, cracking and um, hissing that comes from the melting ice which kind of evolves over time, which we weren't expecting. Very dramatic at the beginning, and it gradually kind of decrescendos. Um, uh, our current project uh, that we're working on uh, involves uh, millions of these uh, neutrally buoyant microspheres, which glow uh, fluorescent under UV light. Um, the idea is that we'll, uh, uh, these are about half a millimeter in diameter, and uh, we pour uh, yeah, literally millions of these into a large tank of water. And because they're neutrally buoyant, they hover. They don't sink or float like uh, many, many glowing stars. And the musical component is that we are transducing sound waves into the tank to create uh, kind of standing waves, uh, depending on the frequency that we uh, pump through our transducer and we're uh, going to try and get physical response, uh, some type of m motion from the spheres so that you get a kind of vis visual correlation uh, from the sound. Uh, this phenomenon is sometimes referred to as cymatics, uh, the visualization uh, of sound uh, through mechanical methods. And maybe you've seen uh, uh, Claudine patterns, which are the same kind of thing as a two-dimensional metal plate with sand uh, with a sine tone going into it, you see kind of hypersymmetrical patterns like this. So I've been uh, talking about this project with uh, uh, professors in the uh, fluid dynamics and uh, acoustics uh, uh, departments, but if any of you have any more, uh, this is very hard. We're working with ultrasound because the speed of sound uh, in water is uh, about five times faster. Uh, so in order to get a wavelength um, that would create interesting patterns, we have to go uh, way up in about 30, uh, kilohertz range beyond what we can hear. Uh, be, uh, besides that, I write concert music for chamber groups or solo instruments. Uh, many of my pieces try to invert kind of the traditional hierarchy of information. So, uh, you know, the primary components of music pitches, uh, especially, are kind of uh, downplayed and uh, peripheral noises are foregrounded. One example is a composition I made out of rewired children's toys uh, that I got from thrift stores uh, around town. Uh, so you open them up and rewire them and connect uh, uh, resistors and transducers to, uh, to places they're not supposed to be connected to. And if you're very careful about it, you can control this with uh, potentiometers and things and get uh, chaotic, uh, kind of beautiful behaviors, unpredictable sounds. Another composition I recently wrote 
is uh, for all glass sounds. That was a severe limitation, I said. I will only use unprocessed recordings of glass. Uh, so I uh, went to Home Depot, I got large window panes, glasses, and carboys, and things like this, and made a composition entirely out of glass. That's what I wanted to play, unfortunately I can't. Um, so I'll end it there since I'm almost out of time. And again, I would like to say that I'm uh, getting more and more interested in collaborative projects. So please, if you know uh, anyone in the visual arts or, or uh, the sciences that are interested in uh, collaborating, I would love to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Now, Neil Thomas of Communication Studies will speak on social computing and the manufacture of sense. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm a recent hire in uh, Communication Studies. I work in the uh, Technology and Media Studies unit. And my interest is in the uh, mediating technical relations of what I call industrial social computing. By industrial, I mean that the software on our laptops, uh, smartphones, and televisions is increasingly structured to interact with large, globally distributed information systems like Google, like Facebook, and Amazon. And by social, I mean that the systems are designed to solicit and store our daily interactions with one another as we share information objects and messages. Some examples here that I'm sure you're familiar with are things like document citation, the expression of cultural taste, the promotion of issues or public commentary, and the maintenance of personal relations. The point is that constant participation is a basic condition of the systems. It makes them social in a couple of different ways. First is that the social interaction generates a kind of computable audience commodity that has market value for the companies in question. And second, it's that the services supplement social life with what I call a, a new kind of truth procedure. So what do I mean by that? I mean that the algorithms and protocols of social computing are a new form in which we invest validity. Uh, they're like our investment into the kind of factuality of, uh, of photographic images, like Sabine uh, pointed out earlier. We invest validity into, into the computer, into social computing as a medium. So the technology produces a kind of self-evidential structure that supports memory and experience. And the fancy word for this is that it's a NEMO technology. And I'm interested in the theoretical underpinnings of how the systems structure recall at the level of technique how they give form to certain generic signifying practices that resolve meaning. So this kind of gets at the talk title. Uh, the systems are a medium for constituting sense in our daily lives, and we can say that sense is being manufactured because the algorithms and protocols now rationalize discourse at a global scale. For me, the term sense has some useful ambiguity. Uh, at one level, we can sort of get away with simply saying that it's something like the organization of common sense. So we're on, when we're online, we leave traces of our thought processes, our searches, our tastes, and our affiliations. We search for people, we do research, we compare products. And here we're making sense for ourselves, but we're also leaving it behind for others once it's made. And the system, this is because the systems aggregate and optimize these traces that we're leaving behind, and it compares them with other people whose common sense is similar to ours. So other ways of defining sense that kind of thicken the, the description would be to say something like the shared consensus of judgment or collectively achieved signification. In other words, the inter interface is helping us make sense um, in our lives uh, and the signs that we encounter in life. An expression or result is grasped as valid, and its validity resolves or reinserts us back into the flow of our lives by satisfying a need for meaning. And this idea is kind of captured well by uh, Google's former CEO, Eric Schmidt, who remarked in 2010 that he thinks, quote, most people don't want Google to answer their questions. They want Google to tell them what they should be doing next. So my own critical interest in understanding sense at a deeper level uh, is at a sort of technological and a at, a, at a level of kind of philosophical abstraction with sense, where sense in social computing means something a lot more specific. And that is to say that there is a formal account of sense that gets operationalized within the systems to fit social interactions together with the internal capacities of the computer. And this is the site that I'm interested in with my research. So to borrow a term from Bruno Latour, there is a technique by which our conventional understanding of sense, common sense, is delegated into the machine. In the case of social computing, this delegation is based on a relationship between mathematics and logic and meaning. And the basic technique comes from a long tradition in analytic philosophy and can be defined in the following way. The sense of something is a possible thought about an object that can be advanced into language by way of an assertion. 
And it's this, the model, it's kind of a technical model of the assertion that kind of drives social computing. So specifically, sense is about assertions that can produce a formal relation between an object and a truth value. So a statement like, the t-shirt is green, or Neil Thomas is employed by UNC, provides a sort of ground for meaning in a particular way. And that is that it breaks up the world into conceptual containers of objects that are employed and objects that are green and so forth. And this is how we are solicited to be social by these new systems. Users generate value for each other and for the services by referencing certain objects over others. So for example, once you've asserted a relation to 10 movie objects in your Netflix account, the system can then insert you into a space of relations asserted by others that you resemble to recommend movies that you haven't seen before. And from a media studies perspective, I'm interested in the consequences of applying this view of formalized sense to a, to a more intimate register of everyday life. So I'm interested in the fact that it's, it's now being applied at a more sort of intimate register of everyday life. So questions are such as, what are the implications of shifting an account of meaning from its traditional ori origins in information retrieval to applying it to what we increasingly understand as a medium for expression and not just retrieval? A second concern in the account I've just given about sense is the tacit ground that sense is based in formal consensus over meaning. So here I want to ask, what effects does this low-level formalized consensus have, account, have upon our understanding of difference in meaning? How does it construct difference in meaning in particular ways? As we use these devices to interface with the world, what happens to the idea of dissensus? How is dissensus formulated or, or formatted along with this kind of formal understanding of sense? And finally, third, there are alternative accounts of sense that come from elsewhere in philosophy, from people like Martin Heidegger, Edmund Husserl, and Gilles Deleuze. And I'm wondering whether their work, which addresses and concerns sense and signification in ways that challenge the widely accepted account embedded in our devices, has things to say about social computing as we currently understand it. So basically I'm asking if through all of these devices, social computing is to serve as such an important mediating social logic going forward, are there different ways we might think about soliciting sense through social computing that run against the, current, uh, run against the grain of current structures uh, of social computing in productive ways? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Neil, very much. Is Julianne? Oh, you are. Okay, wonderful. Um, Julianne Hammer from the Department of Religious Studies will um, speak on men, how, how men are the protectors of women. I'm so short you can barely see me. Um, This is a social experiment. Um, being brief is not one of my strong sides. Um, I can talk for a really long time about all kinds of things. So um, I picked this title for this talk. Um, so this is a line from um, a verse from the Quran, um, 434. Um, it's the beginning of that verse. And I picked it not just because it's sort of mysterious if you don't know what it is, but also because it frames a particular um, dilemma or a set of dilemmas that I want to talk about that have to do with a research project that I've been working on for the last four years that looks at American Muslim efforts against domestic violence. And um, I do this in a number of different ways. I have done um, about three years worth of ethnographic research um, with American Muslim um, advocates and activists against domestic violence. Um, and I have also um, a, a sort of um, part of the research is also to look at, um, to carry out textual analysis of discourses on Islamic marriage models, so um, ideas about what ideal Islamic marriage is supposed to look like and what that might have to do with domestic violence and um, to provide sort of um, um, religious and textual resources. Um, let me take one minute to talk about Muslim work against domestic violence, which goes back, as far as I can tell, at least to the early 1990s. There have been communal efforts before that, but this is sort of traceable in terms of organizations. Um, that takes three distinct forms. One is um, uh, raising awareness of domestic violence in Muslim communities. The second one is to provide training in what is usually called cultural competency. Um, trainings um, for uh, non-Muslim providers of services and for law enforcement um, and also for lawyers on occasion. 
Um, and the third one is direct services, including legal services, financial assistance, and um, a very small number of shelters that, um, that are run by Muslim organizations, specifically for Muslim women. Um, I brought to this project several additional years of research and sort of embeddedness in American Muslim communities, um, work on American Muslim women and gender discourses, um, and more specifically, a focus on feminist Quran interpretation. And then the third sort of leg for me has been um, my own feminist commitment to um, studying family, marriage, gender discourses, and patriarchy, and through that, um, where domestic violence comes from. And in the years that I've been carrying out this research, one of my biggest struggles has been that many of the Muslim GB advocates that I work with and that I've um, come to know very well um, carry out their research from a completely different perspective. So one aspect of that is um, that many of them advocate um, an Islamic marriage model that is based on a hierarchical um, gender relationship. So men are protectors of women or men are supporters of women. Men are heads of household. Um, this is very familiar to Christian um, anti-domestic violence advocates as well. Um, so it, this is not something that's just specific to Muslims. Um, and within that framework, their argument is domestic violence occurs when the Islamic marriage model doesn't work properly. So when men don't do the things that they're supposed to, to do. Um, and when I first encountered that, I, I just had sort of, it was both an ethical dilemma, but it was also sort of an issue of how am I going to analyze that? What am I going to do with that? And it also runs up in, in really profound ways um, against mainstream domestic violence work. So state um, coalitions and um, secular organizations who usually assume that religion is part of the problem. Um, and they don't look for um, solution fo solutions from within religious communities and religious frameworks. Um, while Muslim and other religious advocates would argue that they are looking for religious solutions to a problem um, that is not caused by their religious tradition. They're adamant about that. It's a really important sort of point. And so um, there's several dilemmas. One is how to work with people who come from totally different perspectives on an issue and who often also have rather negative ideas about feminism and feminist theory and um, will not necessarily talk to me anymore when they realize that that's sort of where I come from. The second one is that I've been concerned over the years that I've been writing about this in a sort of tentative kind of way with um, how quickly analysis in, in, in this particular context turns into deconstruction. When my own um, activist engagement or my own commitment is also to eradicate domestic violence. And so I feel like I'm not in a position to say, um, you are doing this the wrong way, um, or we're going to measure you by um, the, the successes that, that, that you show as opposed to other kinds of approaches. The fact of the matter is many of the laws that have been passed since the 1970s and many of the efforts against domestic violence in the US context have not led to a decrease in the level of domestic violence in American families. Um, and then the third one is that is, is something that maybe I should have started with, which, which is that in a climate of Islamophobia and anti-Muslim sentiment that is very widespread in American society, the, the mere fact that I talk about domestic violence in Muslim communities can be used and utilized in so many ways that I don't want to be complicit in um, because it basically reinvests the idea that Muslim men are violent and Muslim women are oppressed and silent. And so I've sort of run in all, into all three of these and um, my way out of that, and I have 45 seconds to say that, um, my way out of that has been to be very upfront about um, those dilemmas. So I've written um, several articles now that basically just um, start by saying, here's my dilemma. I'm going to explain it to you. I'm going to explain to you what I've been finding. And I want to help, I want you as a reader to help me figure out what to do with that. And that's what I'm going to leave you with too. Thank you so much, Julianne. 
And once again, thank you to our, our 10 presenters for uh, such an incredible range of diverse, engaging, and very concise presentations. So